Professor, how surprised are you to find yourself sitting here in Princeton in the middle of your professional life? You were born a long way away from here. Can you tell me a little bit about your childhood? Uh, yeah, I was born in India in a city in Rajasthan called Jodhpur. Um, and uh, my family moved around a little bit during my uh, childhood. Uh, we were in Delhi for a few years and Kota, another city. Was this Rajasthan. because of your father's position? My, yeah. What did he do? Uh, he was a, a professor also uh, in civil engineering in the civil engineering in the city's engineering college. And uh, your uh, mother was at home. At home, yeah. At home. How many children in the family? Three, three children. Yeah, one brother and one sister. Um, I'm always interested in the expectations that parents have for their children. As you were growing up, let's imagine you eight, ten years old. Um, what kind of uh, expectations, guidance were you getting from your parents? So in India, of course, parents are very concerned about their kids' education and uh, the expectations are set according to that. Uh, but apart from that, I don't think there were any special expectations. Uh, um, uh, yeah, we did well in our classes from a fairly early age. and so With uh, an early passion evident in one direction or another, or just... Enjoying school and taking all the courses? Yeah, I, I don't think I had a special passion or anything. Uh, uh, actually, even right through high school, I was just good at uh, good academics. Good at school. Yeah. And, yeah, and in India, you it, certainly back then, there were no special camps or special classes. Right. For, I didn't even know I was gifted in any way. I mean, I was just yes. good in my one class, then there are... Uh, hundreds of classes around the city. I had no, yeah. So, uh, teachers of some significance in that early pre-university period. No, not. I mean, yeah, nothing. Oh, maybe, maybe by high school. I mean, there was some. You have a little bit more connection with the teacher and with the subject, but yeah, certainly up to grade ten or nine, maybe not much. Yeah. I spoke to uh, another person in this series of of uh, interviews of, of Indian origin and in his household the hope, expectation and push was to the civil service. Uh, the idea that you would do what it was to get you to that point. Was, there was none of that in your... Uh, I don't think civil service per se. I mean clearly that was considered the epitome of success or something but uh, uh, um, but I think there was some general expectation among kids those days that, uh, so in the Indian competitive exams, you, you're tested on your general knowledge. So, you know, that you know a lot about lots of things, ah. a generalist. Right. Uh, so that's what you're tested for. Right. And the, the special passion is actually almost a disadvantage. You need to know the broad. Oh, I certainly know help, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, there was no, at least when I was growing up, there wasn't a sense that you have to excel in a particular, a particular discipline. Right? Well, when you graduated from high school, and was it a public school, private school? Uh, private school, yeah. It was a private which school. Which is called a public school. In, yeah, yeah. Oh, which is called, of course, in the, in the English way. Uh, but it was a private school in, yeah. in our terms. And... Um, comes a time where you have to decide what to do after graduation. How are you making that decision from high school? Oh, from high school. Uh, so there again in India, there are from an early age, you, you, it gets drummed into your head that the two professions are engineer or doctor. Okay. And uh, in those days, I'm not sure if the system is still the same now, probably still, that after ninth grade or 10th grade, you you decide on the math track or the life sciences track okay to get into one of those two and i'm just guessing you decide on the math track. that's correct yeah um okay so you're now on your way to possibly being an engineer yeah or something like that yeah something okay so how, what do you do after high school how does one 
uh, does one apply? Again, is the application system similar to American universities? Is there a general test one must take? Right, so the system is completely different uh, and still is the case. There's a national exam and uh, uh, the premier institutions, uh, certainly for a technical education, were the IITs, the Indian Institutes of Technology, and uh, there was a general exam, a national exam for that. Uh, you show up two days in the year, or, you know, uh, at this one exam, everybody takes it at the same and time. And it determines your life, in a way. It determines your admission into these premier institutes. Right. Uh, and you get, a, you get ranked nationally, yeah. I'm just guessing you did well? I did well, yes. And that meant you had the option of going where? To any of the institutes, yeah. And which did you Study. choose and why? Um, I went to IIT Kanpur. Uh, there was no good reason. I mean, this is way before, or somewhat before, World Wide Web. This is 1986, so okay. certainly in India, we didn't even have email back then, certainly in the small cities. So, um, there was no information. I mean, you some you know somebody who went there who liked it. You know those kinds of yeah, things. Yeah. It's wasn't based on anything. Yeah, not very things. But it, it certainly was an institution of prestige. That's right. One of the five. Yeah. Right. And uh, okay, you arrive. Do you have to again? Instructing me in the university process there is 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 very helpful. You have to declare a major. You ha basically have a prescribed course that you must take, how does it go? Right, so that's actually uh, interesting. So uh, sometime in high school, I started thinking maybe I'd like to do physics just because physics has such, I think in retrospect, looking back, physics has a tremendous um, uh, outreach, uh, you know, popular books and um, Everybody knows who Einstein is and, right, you know, right. and all that. And you're, so, and you're somewhat ambitious. Would, would it be fair to call you at this age ambitious? Uh, yes. So I think by that point, because I'd done so well in the national exam, I, I mean, that was the first time I realized that I was... Uh, you had potential. Yeah, I mean, uh, certainly uh, to uh, be among the top people in, in the country in that year. So... Uh, so, um, yeah, I had a college principal who, um, he and I used to chat a lot, and uh, uh, he, he was urging me to do something with my life, not, as he would say, okay. you know, just uh, do the same material, uh, go for the same material success that everybody else wants to do. When you were listening. And I was listening, yeah. And... Um, and suddenly, just by reading and this, you know, the physics outreach and so on. I mean, I, I had a sense for you know, beautiful science, and uh, that seemed like an attractive choice. But since I had uh, scored very well in this national exam, I could pick any major. So your the major you got depended on your standing score. in this exam. Wow. So uh, so I could pick any major, and the top major in those days and probably still today is computer science in India and so uh, I had some familiar pressure to at least try computer science and uh, and so uh, so that's what I involved so the, the physics was an idea that then gets shelled not completely so then uh, around that time um, a cousin of mine had gotten into MIT, and uh, this I had no idea how this happens because some some university over in the U.S. admits you and gives you full scholarship, which translated into Indian rupees is some ginormous sum. <laughs> so <laughs> how the heck that happens, I had no idea. But because this cousin of mine who was who who lived in Delhi and was you know, they were much more well off, so they were much more globally connected. Yes. Um, so this cousin had figured out that system, SATs and yes. and recommendations and the whole American system. So he had gotten into MIT with full scholarship. So that's uh, so that's when I learned that this is possible and what this procedure is. I learned from my cousin, 
And so then I decided to apply for an American university and, uh, and maybe do physics there. Because I could see that at an IIT, doing physics or chemistry wasn't as glamorous, exciting, whatever. Right. Um, because in those days, the goal of going to a premier university was so that you could go to grad school in the US. So I thought I would just short circuit that and go as an undergrad and maybe study physics or something. So this was not actually formally because of dissatisfaction with where you were, but just seeing this new possibility and maybe truncating a longer study into a shorter amount of time? No, I was interested in research. I thought I would like to do research. Okay. And that was but not what you that, were going to get. At IIT, yeah, certainly. You'd been holding position for four years until you get to go to grad school and do research. Right. Whereas uh, I had a sense that in, in the U.S. at a top university as an even... So what age are you when you make the, the 18. bid for MIT? 18. 18. Yeah. So as a freshman, I applied for a transfer. Right. Uh, yeah. And then I got accepted. Right. Uh, but then I didn't come in freshman year because my application for financial aid didn't reach them. Somehow got lost in the mail. And it would have been unthinkable without some oh, yeah. financial support. So, so then I wrote to them and they deferred my admission by a year. And so I came after sophomore year. Had they promised that money would come in a year or they were just willing to wait with you and see whether you would get financial support the next year? I mean, I, yeah, I, I, th as, as a, I think, yeah, they, they gave me financial support the next year. Not, they didn't promise me. But I think it, uh, I had the sense from my cousin, I think, that the, the bigger hurdle is to get in. Uh, at that time, MIT was very good that way. They would admit a small select band of international students, right. uh, and everybody who needed money would get it, whatever money they needed. So uh, what you go, uh, I'm assuming your family is excited about this for you, rather than saying, don't go so far, but maybe that maybe there was some discussion about you're not going. No, there no. wasn't. No. Okay. Yeah, Indian parents uh, sort of yeah take that. Were thrilled. I, I wouldn't say thrilled. I mean, they're never thrilled to send their kid away so far away. But yeah, uh, it was a good thing. They yeah, they I think that was so. Was the, the first experience cultural shock when you come to MIT, or do you immediately? find yourself among inter interesting people and you're happy and you're not homesick or is it a rough first year? Um, well, intellectually it was thrilling, really? fantastic. I mean, you open this thick book of courses and you're free to take anything. Who would ever heard of such a thing? Right. I mean, in India they tell you, okay, you come in, these are six courses you take this year. So. That was thrilling. A catalog of courses, and you can pick anything. Um, socially, you know, it takes some time to adjust. Um, uh, one thing I did was I uh, got I uh, uh, got admitted to this independent living group, uh, kind of like a co-ed fraternity, but it wasn't affiliated with a national organization. Mm -hmm. Uh, about 30 people in a house. Uh, so that was nice. So there was a community that I... Any other there. Indians in the community? In that house, MIT you mean? Or oh, at MIT, sure, there were Indians, yeah. Including among the faculty? Uh, a few, yeah. But that's not... So I mean, that isn't consoling or something, it's just... Oh, no, yeah. Faculty were busy, and uh, I don't think I interacted with any Indian faculty there. Uh, I mean, I'm sure I talked to one or two, but yeah, yeah. yeah. But, yeah but the people I did research with, yeah. No, no. Okay, um, help me with your decision once at MIT as to which direction your education. You have the banquet before you, the big catalog. Yeah. Um, how do you select? Uh, ah, so that, that was actually interesting. So in the year, because I hadn't, uh, I had to defer for a year, so I had more time to further my education. And I guess at the back of my mind, I thought I might be going anyway. So I started reading on my own and I had access to more books at the library. And, um, and I started getting more interested in math. 
uh, now in retrospect, now I realize I had no idea what math was. I mean, I'm talking about <laughs> linear algebra, basic algebra, which is very different from research mathematics. Right. Um, but uh, that sounded kind of cool too. So I was a little bit less sure of doing physics at that point. And then um, I uh, come to MIT and I realize that there is this major called mathematics with computer science. Uh, and uh, I looked into this field a little bit, probably over the summer or something, or maybe as soon as I arrived. And that sounded pretty exciting as well. You know, things like cryptography and algorithms, that sounded all pretty cool as well. So, so I ended up in that, um, that major and I actually took a physics course and I sort of was less interested in that yeah. by that point. Were you prepared? to jump into a computer specialty. You described India at that time as barely even having email and so forth. Uh, you may not have had much access to computers before you got there. So how is it that you are embracing this? Oh, so and, and remember at IIT, I was studying computer science for two years. That's so, true, that's true. Uh, so, yeah. I had taken a few courses, uh, which I, actually didn't like so much because those were programming courses. But this math end of computer science, which is what I ended up doing, uh, seemed much more exciting. Who are your uh, key professors as you develop this specialty? At MIT? Yes. Uh, so I was lucky enough to end up in the research group of uh, Professor Tom Layton. Um, and uh, he had some grad students. Uh, who were mentoring me, uh, so that was fantastic. So I, probably within a couple of weeks after I, I arrived at MIT, I was in this group with this, uh, and they were part of a larger group of uh, maybe 10 to 12 faculty, maybe something like that, mm -hmm. in, in this field, mathematical computer science. So, What questions were they pursuing, the your seniors, so to speak, the, the professors, the uh, the graduate students, were there specific directions of inquiry? Where, what is, where are we now and we're in the late 80s? No, uh, the mid uh, Yeah, okay. late 80s, yeah. Um, so in terms of the state of the field, in terms of their kinds of research interests, what are they pursuing with your learning from them at this point? So uh, th this group that I was uh, a member of uh, was interested in parallel computing. So, uh, which is still an ex interesting field right now. Um, so you have multiple processors in a computer instead of one, uh, like thousands, and mm -hmm. uh, you want to harness them to do computations faster, which is not as easy as it sounds. You know, you would imagine that, sure, I mean, yeah, I guess you can, suppose there's a task, you know, which one person can do well. Now, if you give it to a thousand people, right, I mean, it's like too many cooks spoiling the broth, right? So it's not clear how to make it all work in computers. Uh, how to divide a job into a thousand. So that, that was the... And you're, you're that, thus made interested in this problem, this... Oh, I should have mentioned that getting into the research group was also a form of employment. Oh. So, uh, which I, I needed to have a ca campus job as part of my scholarship. Okay. So this was the campus job I got, uh, helping out with research and whatever they needed done. You are intellectually engaged. I mean, this is not just standing by somebody who's doing the real work and you're feeding something. I mean, you, you are challenged from the first in this group intellectually. Uh, it, it's in stages. Um, I mean, the way it works, and this happens to me from the other side now, you know, that no, you take on all kinds of students and some are more talented than others, and then the ones who are talented get involved more and uh, right. given interesting problems and so they become... I'm going to wildly guess again that you were talented and so yeah. um, So you got involved in interesting projects, problems. Yeah, after a year and... After a year, uh, so soon. Yeah, and uh, so we had a paper uh, within a couple months uh, which I made so you're, contributions. So you're published in your second year there? Uh, yeah, done like after my first year that summer. Yeah. Okay, what was that topic? It was in parallel computing, yeah. Uh, 
connecting up parallel computers and uh, speeding up communication amongst them. Uh, what was, and I, I'm not a specialist, but what was the insight that the paper rested on? The insight was that uh, if you connect up the processors randomly, then that's actually a very good interconnection network. Oh. So you'd imagine that uh, based upon our, uh, you know, how you design a city's transportation infrastructure or something, that you take a lot of planning to decide, okay, this road connects here and whatever, this bridge there. But we discovered that, uh, I mean, this was part of that group, but I mean, I helped push it further. What we discovered was that randomly interconnected networks are actually really good at uh, communicating fast. Which was kind of counterintuitive. Yeah, I mean, uh, not in hindsight, but yeah, uh, if you first tell somebody that fact, it right. seems very counterintuitive. You're surprised. As opposed to a fully designed by human network. Uh, does the MIT undergraduate uh, process require a thesis at the end of the four years? No. No. So you, you took the courses, you developed uh, your interests, uh, fortunately, in this in this uh, advanced world, um, so I need to get you graduated and deciding on your next step. Right. So then, uh, yeah, I decided I like this field, uh, theoretical computer science. I've uh, done a few courses in it as an undergrad. I've uh, done research, so I decided to pursue it in grad school and uh, applied to grad schools and uh, chose Berkeley. What were the, the choice of schools and did the choice involve different emphases? Did the various schools present themselves as particularly good in one direction or another that you would be interested in? Or so I applied in this discipline, uh, the mathematical the end of computer science. That yeah. I understand. Um, what difference would it have made to have gone to Berkeley as opposed to uh, maybe stayed at MIT or... Was this yeah, a, that was an option, yeah. That was, that was probably my two top choices, yeah. And why Berkeley? I visited there and uh, uh, I really liked the town. Like California? Yeah. Um, and uh, uh, I loved MIT intellectually, but I thought it was uh, a little lacking socially. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was a so, I mean, you would have advanced in either place, in short, but it was a social decision to choose between two intellectually equal opportunities. Yeah, yeah. Um, so the way people make decisions very often, as long as it's comparable. I mean, if you had gone to Berkeley, right, uh, which you did. Yeah. Um, do you think that that though in the end affected the direction of your research for having gone to Berkeley? Uh, what they were doing there. Yeah, I mean, these are the unknowns of life. Right. Uh, uh, almost certainly, yeah. I mean, you go to a different place, you. You uh, have to do. You do end up doing other things. Um, I think one thing I realized uh, I, what, that I now think in retrospect mm -hmm. it happened is that going to a new place is terrifying. Well, in general, any kind of change is terrifying. Uh, you lose the comforts of whatever you're used to, uh, but it uh, helps you grow. Yes, and uh, that was. I mean, I'd already done that a yeah, few times. Yeah, this is twice. I'd I'd done. Uh, I'd done it in high school, midway through high school, because my father had to move, and then uh -huh. went to IIT and then MIT, uh, and I could see. I think that it's terrifying, but it's but, but it has better leads to growth. Right. Um, yeah, it allows you to change uh, because nobody knows you in the new place. Yeah. Uh, you can do whatever. You can present yourself, however. Um, so, uh, so it turned out to be a beneficial decision. In that sense, yeah. So you have to figure out things anew, what the faculty are up right. to. Whereas at MIT, I knew already what the ah, faculty were. So, so there you are good. in Berkeley. Yeah. Um, uh, you have the equivalent of a large range of possibilities. Uh, you have a faculty with whom you can follow in various aspects. How are you making those decisions now? What, what, what next intellectually for you? So that was a little bit less clear, yeah. So um, uh, towards the end of my undergrad career, I'd become interested in the P versus NP problem. 
And uh, in fact, that was my goal in grad school to work on that. Uh, I had started working with some faculty at MIT who, this is not in parallel computing now, so this is on topics related to the famous P versus NP problem. Um, so I was uh, trying to pursue that at Berkeley. Uh, and now in retrospect, I mean, there's still basically no progress on that problem. So, um, Well, what is the, again, speaking to a layman, what is the core challenge of the problem? In P versus NP? So in P versus NP, uh, the, the core question is, uh, is uh, whether or not uh, there is uh, any advantage to getting lucky. So uh, a problem has uh, many possible solutions and you're looking for the optimal solution. So an NP is the set of problems where when you have an optimum, optimum solution before you, you can verify, okay, where the solution you're looking for, the correct solution, you can verify it. So, um, so I won't give a technical definition, but that's the idea. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. So it's kind of like, you know, your math problems. Uh, it's difficult to solve them, but when somebody gives you a solution, it's much easier to verify that it's correct. Right. So that sort of is an example of an NP problem, actually. Right. So, uh, uh, so you're trying to show that, uh, so the question, the P versus NP question is, um, can all such problems be solved efficiently? And, at and you would guess that no, the answer is no, clearly no, because uh, there's many possible Very solutions. Right. And uh, you may ha it's, it's kind of like looking for a needle in the haystack, the correct solution. And so once you find the needle, you'll recognize it's there, but how do you find it in the haystack? Right. Uh, so, uh, but the question is, uh, is that true? You know, that uh, there's no shortcut to finding the Right. Right in the haystack, and uh, it's a famous question in mathematics at this point, and uh, uh, people believe the answer is no, that computers don't have a shortcut for finding the needle in the haystack, but uh, uh, nobody is able to show that. It's a difficult mathematical problem. I could ask a very basic question, and that is, broadly, can one divide these inquiries into theoretical and applied interest uh, as, as you develop a career as you're now in graduate school are these questions that fascinate for their own sake or, or, or in your mind is there some goal of application for it right so if um, the P versus NP conjecture is false namely that P equals NP which means that there is an efficient way to find needles in haystacks then this, this would have great practical implications. Uh, for example, there would be no cryptography uh, because you would be able to break crypto systems efficiently. Uh, on the other hand, uh, most interesting problems of optimization in real life would be solvable efficiently. Huh. So that's a consequence. So, so it has many practical consequences if this conjecture is false. Right. Uh, but to show that the conjecture is true, there are f somewhat fewer applications. Uh, okay, so cryptography might exist or something, but uh, there are somewhat fewer applications. It's more of a philosophical question. It's a little bit intellectually descended from Gödel's inquiry, Gödel's theorem, which placed sharp limitations on formal mathematics. So these, the P versus NP question is, is descended from that uh, because it actually turns out pertains to the existence of efficient theorem proven procedures. Is it fair to say, uh, just as an impression from what you just described, that your own interest, in, let's even call it intellectual temperament, is more toward the philosophical? I mean, are, are you happy to live within that kind of problem solving without? So uh, you mean like the abstract mathematics? Exactly. So, so certainly in that phase of life, yes, I was okay. very interested in that. I, I mean, I've had other phases. Um, and uh, so that was the question. Does that lead to, well, it does lead to a dissertation somehow. What, what is that dissertation going to be? Okay, so now 
So I tried this inquiry uh, for a year. Tried it. Oh, okay. Uh, and I wasn't getting very far. Uh, and of course, I became aware of all the other smart people. Talked to them, you know, at conferences and so on, and right. realized they were all stuck to exactly. Um, and then in my at, in, at the start of my first year, uh, I uh, start reading some other new research that had come out, which people uh, had told me was very important and interesting. Uh, and so that is what I really managed to make some good contributions to and became my thesis, which was not P versus MP, actually. Okay, so again, to a layman, what is the core element or challenge addressed by your thesis? Okay, so, um, so it's inspired by P versus MP. So suppose you assume that P is different from MP. There is no efficient way to get optimum solutions to right. problems to these large class of problems. Can you compute efficiently approximate solutions? Huh. So you just want to get within 10% of optimum. Yes. You, know, you define it appropriately. Something like that. You know, can you do that efficiently? So this is a question of approximation. And uh, thanks to some uh, work that had happened, that was just happening in those year or two up, leading up to that point, uh, there were the right techniques that, that had become available to address these questions. Okay. And in fact, uh, what I showed with colleagues was uh, that actually for many interesting problems, uh, computing approximate solutions is no easier than computing optimum solutions. Oh. So therefore, if you believe in P being different from NP, then you should not expect to have efficient approximation algorithms oh. for these problems, for these. So this large essentially problems. is what you demonstrated. That's what I demonstrated. Yeah. So it's a consequence of P not being NP that you also wouldn't have good approximation algorithms. Or to put it another way, if you had a good approximation algorithm, you would actually have an exact algorithm. Understood. So now you're at the cusp of finishing the form, formal education of, uh, of a, an academic um, career, the beginnings. Um, do you see yourself, because you are broadly in the computer, computational world, do you see yourself as having the alternative of an industrial or an academic future? Or is the direction of your research and interest always going to keep you in the academic world? Yeah, so uh, this kind of inquiry, mathematical and of computer science, algorithms, complexity, it, uh, it is done in an industrial research lab. So at the time, that would have been IBM or uh, uh, Bell Labs, were the two main ones, uh, and some smaller labs. Um, uh, but uh, I was more interested in academia. Uh, and there wasn't any. Um, storm of the soul about where, where shall I go no, uh, in, in this. You were, you were headed in an academic framework. Right. Where are you going to go now that you have your dissertation in hand, uh, a series of problems that interest you? What next? So um, I ended up here. Uh, uh, that was... Uh, the best job offer I had that year, and I ended up at Princeton. So and tell me what Princeton's virtues were as you looked to a, a career here. Uh, Princeton, uh, even back then, had a very strong research group in this area, uh, including uh, uh, Tarjan, uh, uh, who was a Turing Award winner, and Andy Yao, who that later on, uh, some years after that, won the Turing Award and many other very highly regarded researchers. So this was certainly a very uh, good job for me. Um, and uh, But even by that point, I sort of was aware that uh, I don't stick with one field of inquiry for very long. Oh, okay. I, I'm okay. interested in all kinds of different things. So I guess that early emphasis in India of being a generalist, yes. and, uh, knowing yes. all kinds of things, sort of uh, uh, stuck. stuck with me. So, uh, it does stick with all Indians, so I don't think it's the Indian number. No, no, but, no, uh, but it did with you. It did with me. Uh, and 
And what, what so, was the nature of an invitation um, to join a faculty, a community of researchers here? Was it the, um, did you have to demonstrate, again, at least at that point, a particular line of inquiry that interested you, or they were essentially just interested, let's call it, in your curiosity? I mean, yeah, so uh, to this day too, I mean, we hire people, we hire people, not, you know, uh, people to do certain projects. Right. And that was true back then too. So uh, you try to hire the best people. Uh, and of course, it, that would mean that they have a demonstrated... Uh, yeah, something, they will have done something. Some, some accomplishment, yeah. Something. But they're not held to that as now you have to follow the following route. That's right. Route. And especially in computer science, it's, uh, it changes completely uh, every decade. So not completely, but a lot. So, so characterize, if you will, the culture of computer science. In, are we now in the early 90s? Where, where? Uh, 1994, I can't remember. Okay, yeah. 94, yeah. Uh, a moment in time. Yeah. What is the broad culture? What are the exciting questions being asked, or at least exciting to you at this point? Um, okay, so maybe I'll answer the first one. So remember, this is the time when the internet is taking off. Uh, the the web exists, and uh, uh, yeah, everybody. I think there was a browser, yeah, Netscape or Mozilla. Uh, what was it called? Uh, the other one that's now called Mozilla. Um, and uh, uh, we are starting the internet boom uh, around that, right? Uh, 1994, uh, maybe 95, 96 was when mm -hmm. it took off. Um, and that had a big impact on computer science. Uh, before that, uh, computer science was very much geared towards uh, big iron computing for industry, servers, and so on. Um, and uh, with, the web, with the web taking off, uh, um, I think it became much, much, very different. I mean, there was much more uh, interest in uh, information retrieval, information processing, understanding networks. So um, networking became a very big area. Mm -hmm. So yeah, computer science as a discipline shifted a lot. Um, so where do you find your place in that culture? So me. Um, so I became more interested in algorithms uh, rather than computational complexity. I was still interested in complexity, but uh, my focus was shifting. Um, and uh, I became interested in these approximation algorithms. So my dissertation work had shown that for a lot of problems, you couldn't do better than a certain approximation ratio for a bunch of problems. But what is the correct approximation ratio for all these interesting problems that you can achieve? So, uh, so I became interested in actually designing algorithms for approximation algorithms for, for many of these problems. I had some success with traveling states on problem which is a classic problem, um, and various other problems along those lines, um, graph partitioning uh, some years later. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm becoming, I'm, I'm, I'm switching in retrospect from sort of more mathematical computational complexity to more mathematical design of algorithms uh, in my first seven, eight years at Princeton, uh, that was a shift I, that happened. Are you finding a particular intellectual companionship? Are you doing projects together with others or mostly developing individual uh, questions on your own? Uh, there's always a conversation, I understand. Yeah, there's always a conversation. But I wasn't closely collaborating with any other Princeton colleagues uh, in this new endeavor. But there were other colleagues uh, in other universities that I did collaborate with, um, and grad students. What is the result of that? those years of inquiry in terms of conclusions you came to, departures into a new dimension? I mean, I think you mostly stayed within that broader inquiry of algorithm. That's right. So that was the comfortable place for you. That was the, That's right. the right one. That's right. But. Um, what were the ongoing challenges within that, the new questions you 
you were asking along the way or asking. I mean, you're yeah. you're in full career. So that's right. So right. So looking back, I think uh, uh, I'm interested in understanding the power of algorithms. And uh, lately, I've been interested in the power of machine learning algorithms. Uh, what's possible with that? But yeah, that's been the maybe the common thread, if you will. Uh, now, uh, given the boundaries of the disciplines, the sub-disciplines of computer science, that inquiry crosses some boundaries. But but yeah, that's the unifying thread, maybe. Do you? I mean, again, I don't want to get epic here because everything is a step at a time, but. Do you see the implications of greater understanding of algorithm affecting a wide range of kinds of inquiry, even beyond formally computational mathematics and so forth? What is your... Oh, yeah. Can you give me some sense of... Right. So actually, that was the other shift maybe that I forgot to mention in the 1990s, that uh, suddenly the world discovered that, uh, that science is moving in the big data era as well. Right whether it's uh, biology, genomics, uh, uh, particle physics, uh, astronomy. So all these sciences uh, were moving into the big data era and they realized that they needed algorithms, new algorithms. Uh, so that was another big shift, which didn't impact my research until more recently, but, but suddenly it was uh, informing the development of algorithms within computer science right. at that point. So, um, so indeed, yeah, uh, design of algorithms uh, broadly uh, conceived is, is a big part of computer science today. So who is coming to you these days? I mean, are you, are you getting interest from colleagues in fields you would not have expected initially to? Yeah, so because I'm doing machine learning, especially in the last few years, okay. uh, six, or so six, seven years. So um, that's maybe even more directly relevant to to the the big data era. Yes. Um, so yeah, I have collaborations with colleagues in other departments at this point. The intellectual culture in which you happily find yourself at Princeton is it um, less boxed in and more? A broader conversation among fields. I mean, I, that's my romantic notion of Princeton that it maybe is less just absolutely field driven. Is that true? Um, it's certainly yeah, easy to find other people, uh, but I, I'm not sure if it's it's probably true for many major universities. I'm guessing. Uh, um, so um, yeah, I think. Um, there's a, there's a lot of cross-disciplinary work, including in our department. Right. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure if it's more so than at other universities, but yeah, maybe at yeah. all top universities. But it is at least here. Yeah, it's definitely valued a lot and uh, and happens a lot. I, I got some sense from the, the reading about you that I did before this that uh, you're quite interested in teaching. It's not one of those necessary evils in order to get your research time, but it seems to be part of how you think. And can you describe yourself as a little bit as a teacher and how this relates to your research? Um, yeah, so teaching is, um, uh, is valued a lot at Princeton, firstly. Um, uh, and um, yeah, I think I was always sort of a teacher. Uh, it took me a long time to realize that, but uh, I was teaching, uh, looking back, a lot of my classmates all along. Mm -hmm. um, and um, probably from a fairly early age, yeah. So, uh, and actually I was uh, talking to some uh, Indian colleagues at some conference dinner once, you know, noticed that, you know, four or five of us, we were all Indians. And um, and I raised this hypothesis that uh, maybe at least the Indians who come here uh, are, are sort of on the achievement track, uh, that maybe all of them were teachers uh, from an early age. And mm -hmm. they all confirmed that that was the case. Really? 
um, yeah, it's culturally maybe a little bit different than the U.S. that the nerds were, maybe it's maybe similar to Hungary or something, the nerds were looked up to <laughs> because it was assumed that they would be successful in life, get those civil service jobs right. or whatever. Uh, so they were, uh, they were among the respected kids in the class. Right. That, and uh, Rather there than was, the underground that they were in America. Right. And uh, there was no shame in asking them for help. And uh, right. so they were actually considered very useful friends to have. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so it sort of it clicked in my mind only a few years ago that this is very different in my upbringing or right. my background than it is in my American colleagues. Uh, Are so, you... Have you found yourself ever doing papers together with some of your graduate students? Oh, all the time, yeah. All the time? Almost exclusively, yeah. I mean, all my paper, almost all my papers I have a, I don't know a grad student co-author, co yeah. Uh, I don't know when was the last time when I had a paper which had no grad student co-author. Um, yeah, so, but yeah, so to finish the teaching yeah, yeah. things, the, yeah, so I think, uh, I, I think I just absorbed from a very early age that Explaining to other students uh, helped me understand much better, which is again something all teachers know. Uh, but I think I'd sort of absorbed that at an early age. Uh, so teaching is very fun. Specifically fundable. about algorithms, and again, based on something that I've read about you, it seems to me you're you're trying to find new ways to to teach uh, about algorithm uh, algorithms and so forth. Are you are you finding that you're teaching now on the subjects that you're so interested in has changed in terms of how you engage your students in the, in the problems or um, is this a yeah there's an evolution based upon my own research interests uh, I'm more interested in machine learning and big data problems so um, so that certainly affected what I teach and what I find interesting right um, and what I think students should know. Um, but beyond that, I think um, uh, th throughout my career, it's been kind of fun to figure out uh, where the discipline should go in terms of teaching because it's a fast-changing discipline. So within algorithms and theoretical computer science, what is interesting to teach today? You know, so figuring that out. I'm, every few I'm assuming, I could be wrong, of course, that one of the things that students ask of their professors, particularly at advanced levels, is where should I go in my research? I mean, of course, the very good students are ones who have their own passions and their own curiosity, as you demonstrated in your own career. But guidance, you know, where do you, where do you think the most interesting, significant developments will be? Where will the money come in to support my research? Do you get those questions and what are your answers? Uh, so yeah, lots of uh, questions like that. Um, yeah, undergrads, uh, w usually undergrads. Usually yeah. undergrads. Uh, I mean, grad students have done that kind of introspection a lot already before coming to grad school, usually. Um, but undergrads, yeah, they come by a lot um, um, to figure out those kinds of uh to and, answer to those kinds of questions. And do you give guidance or do you yeah, yeah. figure it out yourself? Uh, no, I mean, to, to the extent that it pertains to research and um, how to get into research and so on. Yeah, sure. So yeah. are there big fields? I mean, someone of the earlier generations than your own, particularly, were at the cusp of a revolution. But you too. I mean, the world before you became interested intellectually in these questions was very different from now. Are we on the cusp of explorations and various fields that your students would feel excited to join? Is there going to be directions? You know, I'm not asking for prophecy. I'm, I'm even talking about the next 10 years, research that you think is particularly exciting that, that they may pick up and address themselves to? Um, so I think the cross-disciplinary work uh, that I've done lately is more applying machine learning ideas to other disciplines. Uh, 
there is a different kind of cross-disciplinary work, which some of my colleagues do, where they are completely embedded in both fields, and in oh. particular in some other field different, apart, different from computer science, uh, neuroscience or uh, biology. Biology, yes. Um, and they have joint appointments and so on. So uh, that's a different kind of uh, work, which I have so far less experience of. I mean, I'm not so deeply embedded in other disciplines. Um, they, people from other disciplines may come with a specific problem uh, related to machine learning or, or uh, analyzing data, and it, maybe I'll help. Are you, are you finding some of your students uh, embedding themselves in two fields? Is that something uh, you can see happening? Has that happened? Uh, none of my students has done that. I mean, they are sort of more in my mode. They are sort of curious and interested in collaborating with the people in other disciplines, but they're not embedded in other disciplines. All right. Last question would really be, at this point in your, in your work, are you developing earlier ideas and inquiries, or are you beginning to wonder about new things and new directions in terms of um, your orientation? Oh yeah, I, I've had a complete, not complete, but very drastic change uh, of inquiry in the last six years or so, as I indicated. Um, I'm interested in the power of algorithms for machine learning and artificial right. intelligence. And that's uh, building as an interest. That's yeah, and yeah, that's what I'm embedded in completely at this point. Um, and uh, um, yeah, so that involves a lot of retooling. Um, uh, retooling in terms of learning first principles, or just uh, yeah, yeah, basically yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, most of it is new. I mean, much of this didn't even exist when I was in grad school. Mm -hmm. um, but that's true in computer science. Yeah, you, if you don't change your fields, you get obsolete very fast because fields uh, do shift a lot. Uh, and uh, but even so, I think yeah, maybe I was among the early ones who made the switch from theoretical computer science into machine learning. Uh, now there may be more people mm -hmm. doing that. Um, and you're still do designing algorithms, but uh, of a very different nature. And the metrics of success are different. Uh, you know, what's a successful algorithm? I mean, it's a little bit more of a technical discussion, but no, it's very different. The, some of the issues are very different. So, um, so it's a different mode of thinking. Thank so, you very yeah. much. Thank you.